Did you know that we were neighbors? Uh, I actually didn't. No. Yeah. Okay, I just came in. Uh, I flew into Logan actually. Okay. Yeah. I'm originally from Rhode Island. Oh yeah, I have a lot of family in Rhode Island actually. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Okay. I was bullshitting, but okay. <laughs> but if you don't mind, and we'll start with I think which one is the music major? Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, so my name is George Molly. Uh, I'm a music major, and I'm also working to get a political science minor at California Polytechnic State University, South Poly Slope. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm. Are you I'm from California originally? I am. Yes, I'm from Denver. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Sorry, yeah. it's okay. Um, and where are you interning here? Uh, I'm youth interning federations? The, yes, the Federation yeah. of Youth Clubs of Army. Good. So, organizing different events. And it's a whole federation of you know, so they all work together in, intertwined through this like, network. Good. It's sort of and your first visit to Army again? It is, yes. Cool, but not his last, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not. Your turn. I'm Eric Zuccari, and I am from San Jose, California, mm -hmm. but originally I was born in Hawaii. Really? Yeah. Where, Honolulu? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then like... Your family was military? Oh, no. Oh, okay. My parents got married and moved to Hawaii right away. Cool. Yeah, sorry for being so long. No, that's fine. Okay, so I am uh, going to be in my second year in the University of San Francisco as a data science major. And I am working at, at Pixar, yeah, yeah. but as a web developer. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Justin, why don't you go first? Uh, my name's Justin. Uh, I just graduated from Fordham University in New York, uh, studying history and political science. Um, uh, it's my first time in Armenia, and I'm interning at the Montenegrin uh, Manuscripts Museum. Dusty Manuscripts, yeah, OK. <laughs> so, yeah, that's about it. And you're from New England originally? Uh, yeah, I'm from Beverly, Massachusetts. Cool. And last but not least. My name is Janae. Uh, I am going into my fifth year at U of M. I major in cognitive science, my where, I'm sorry, where University of Michigan. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I'm majoring in cognitive science, minoring in Armenian studies, and I made, um, I'm interning with a NGO called Ovnushun. Of course, yeah, Ovnushun. the yeah. Cool. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Who's t running Armenian studies at Michigan now? Uh, I believe right now it's Kevor Bordachian, but he doesn't want to do it anymore. That's He's why like, I'm yeah, so <laughs> he wants to pass it, pass it down. He so. has wanted to for a while. <laughs> That's why I asked. Okay, good. Uh, Garik, if you don't mind. Yeah, that sure. Garik Mezoyan, born here, um, although left Armenia at the age of 13. I did my GCSEs in Thailand, then moved to England. And currently, I am a final year BA student at King's College London, studying international relations and business studies. I'm doing an internship in the Regional Studies Centre. Just so you know, I'm Richard Giragosian. I moved here approximately 12 years ago. Uh, actually, after spending 20 years in Washington, having left New England right out of university. I used to be in the US Senate. Um, and I should say, given the situation in Washington, I'm a Democrat, I, that needs explanation, given the Trump administration. Um, and I'm running an independent think tank here in Armenia, uh, focusing on everything from economics to political reform to uh, military and national security as well. So you guys recently went to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, met with I would say the leading figures. My good friend Masis Malian is a foreign minister, one of the best and the brightest. Uh, Ashok Gulian is also a good friend, parliamentary chairman, very committed to democracy. Uh, Bako Sahakyan, very much not a friend, but is the leader of the Gurdjieff Karabakh. Um, and for you, I think it was a historic opportunity. Given the April 2016 most serious fighting over the Gurdjieff Karabakh, and given the change of government in Armenia. Uh, but today, despite the heat, despite the discomfort, this will not be the traditional lecture or meeting you perhaps have become used to in Armenia. I think it would be much better to have an informal discussion and almost a comparing notes of what's going on in Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, more generally, even in the diaspora, but in terms of whatever specific issues are of most interest to you. 
Um, and in that way, I want to start with two questions. Just in general, and there is no right or wrong answer, but from your perspective, I'm curious to see who exactly would you identify as the most serious threat to Armenia? It, it could be the risk of war from Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. It could be Turkey, etc. Who or what do you see as the most serious challenge to Armenia today, in your opinion? Justin, as the poli sci I'll start with you. Um, I guess it, uh, it's not really like a military threat, but more kind of overcoming like Russian uh, dominance and oversight, uh, I think is a major obstacle that Armenia struggles with. Um, I know like security-wise, it's most people would probably say Azerbaijan or Turkey. Um, okay. Well, so much for my trick question, because Justin actually just nailed it. <laughs> Specifically, I have long argued as a trick question that the most serious threat to Armenian national security was not Azerbaijan or Turkey, but was internal corruption, the lack of democracy. Similarly, this question today is identifying Armenia's security partner as the most unreliable and recently unfriendly partner or challenger to Armenia, Russia. And if we look at the recent statements by the half-Armenian Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, uh, there is increased concern over Russia's position regarding Armenia, which I assume you have been following. Why has Russia suddenly seemed to turn against Armenia, do you think? Okay, let's step back. How has Russia engaged in a new policy toward Armenia? For example, the arms sales to Azerbaijan have been increasingly significant. But, to be fair, Russia has also lost key players and key partners in Armenia, including the former president turned prime minister, Serge Sarsyan, the former prime minister, Gazprom executive, Karim Karapetyan, and former president, Bob Kocherian, who is much more than a Robert De Niro lookalike. But in general, let's go back to what I did promise. An informal discussion based on topics of interest to you and less topics of interest to me. Um, what, what specifically do you want to start with in terms of where we are? Is it going into 100 days of a very young and inexperienced government? and what that means, for example, or other issues? I think we're all pretty interested in the Velvet Revolution and its effects, whether uh, actual or perceived. Good. One question, though. Was it a revolution? <laughs> the only reason I ask is, in the beginning, it was the forced resignation of a longtime leader, but it wasn't yet a revolution in terms of sweeping systemic change, where even in the parliament, some of the same figures remain. I think what's interesting is it was more velvet than a revolution and is just beginning. Um, but to be honest, I'm a little bit worried and concerned. Uh, on the one hand, giving Given the lack of experience, we have some ministers who are perhaps too young to shave if they're males, um, and with no real experience in governing a country. Nevertheless, a tremendous improvement over the past 10 years. If we look at previous governments, plural, and if we look at the degree of arrogance and impunity, as well as entrenched corruption. Um, but I really think we're at a turning point also in terms of remaking the relationship between the Republic of Armenia and the diaspora, and whether this will trigger closer interest and engagement by the diaspora, and more of a willingness by the Armenian government to find a way to harness, to leverage that potential. Because up until now, there's been a failure to communicate on both sides as well as, for many of us, 
obvious cultural differences to be diplomatic about it. You guys are ordinarily not shy, so I'm gonna prompt you. Uh, anything else that has sparked your interest while you're here, either positive or negative? Everything really, I mean, it's just so new to me, to my mm -hmm. experience. Um, I think going back to what you said about, I definitely agree with a lot of what you said about like new government. Um, that's a, that's a worry that I've heard a lot of people talk about, is that it's so young, so many, so many people are so young, and at the same time it's, uh, you know, there's certain change going on, but there's not exactly like complete systemic change, like you said, like, um, yet. yet, yeah, Hopefully. yeah, it seems like the dialogue between, by what people are saying, whether it's propaganda, quote unquote, or just what people are saying or not, is, um, they want to move towards a situation that's, they have a system that's more fluid and more uh, progressive a little bit, and just do, that's able to, to be more fluid and work together better. And um, I think a lot of problems to, I, I definitely agree with the first thing you said about like the, uh, how most of the problems within, like, the, most of the threats to Armenia, I mean, it's completely internal. I mean, beyond the security, Factors of the border of Azerbaijan and Karabakh, and uh, Turkey even not so much. They're not really attacking the border. Well, that's my opinion too. But generally, the view from the diaspora in general yeah. is an older threat misperception mm -hmm. that sees Turkey as more of a threat than perhaps it really is. But what's interesting too, from an American perspective, is. I would say the lack of democracy, the lack of governing this country, it's much less acceptable. There's much less of an excuse. If you look at the size of San Jose, if you look at the size of Honolulu, <laughs> if you look at the size of your hometowns, even Beverly, Mass, local municipal government uh, actually fills the potholes, collects the garbage, delivers the basic services, and participates in generally free and fair elections. Armenia has much less of an excuse. The other side of that argument, though, is perhaps we're not being fair enough. Independence in Armenia, to what degree Armenia has independence, is still relatively recent. I mean, the American system has developed over hundreds of years. It's really not a fair comparison to look at Armenia's 25 years of independence and expect a Western-style democracy overnight. The other interesting thing is the perspective we often forget. Armenia, unlike every other post-Soviet state, started two steps behind everyone else. It was stricken by an earthquake during the Gorbachev period, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, a devastating earthquake that destroyed not only infrastructure, but industry. And second, Armenia was at war even before becoming independent. These two obstacles were, let's say, burdens that no other post-Soviet country faced. What Armenia did have in common with Russia, Ukraine, Tajikistan, was the Armenians went to sleep one night, woke up the next morning, and said, oh shit, the Soviet Union has collapsed. We're not ready for independence. There was no experience since 1918 to 1920 with democratic government, with the role of an opposition, with an open economy. So we do need to give a little more credit to Armenia's achievements and survival based on earthquake, war, and no preparation for independence. But I would agree with Justin, one of the bigger threats today is a dangerous over-dependence on Russia, economically as well as militarily. And to what degree Russia allows Armenia to strengthen its independence and sovereignty. Now, none of us have the answers, but I do think the change of government was perhaps long overdue and 
a generally optimistic achievement. We can be constructively critical and skeptical and hold them to an even higher account. In other words, compared to the previous government, I expect more from this government, not less. And there is a degree of high expectations for the government to deliver, and perhaps to deliver unfairly or unreasonably quickly. But we have turned the page, and I do think we are moving ahead. What are your thoughts into the anti-corruption and the recent arrest of the former president, however? Because for some, it represents the danger of the ends justifying the means in terms of shortcuts in the rule of law. What's, what's your take on, uh, let's say, the crackdown on former officials or the arrest of the former president? If, if any. <laughs> I think it's better than, you know, looking at the entire government and seeing corruption that's not being handled in any way. What's interesting as well is, from a legal point of view, there's far too little that I understand than, than what I do know. In other words, to what degree does he enjoy immunity from his time in office? I'm not quite sure. The legal questions are, uh, confusing for me because I'm by no means an expert on the Armenian legal system. Um, moreover, there are some other concerns. Uh, one of the key partners for the current government in Parliament to deliver a working majority is the country's second largest party, Prosperous Armenia, which is a party that is led by a Donald Trump-style businessman. And it raises questions why none of his business interests have yet been investigated, or none of uh, his party's so-called oligarchs have been targets in anti-corruption. So there are actually as many questions as there are answers. I just wanted to ask, um, to, what, to what degree like, can we look at like Georgia and like, their sort of pivot towards the West, towards the EU? Um, and the friction that's caused with Russia, like, to what degree can we look at that as maybe an example of what might happen if Armenia tries kind of too quickly to cut ties with Russia with the new revolution? I know they've kind of like come up against some stumbling blocks. The new government kind of had a lot of rhetoric of wanting to cut ties, and then they kind of realized that wasn't really a realistic option. That's a very good question because what it reveals is some of the strategy as this new government came to power in April and May. Because what was interesting were three specific lessons that Nikol Pashinyan as current prime minister and the new government were committed to following. The first lesson was much of the change of government in Armenia was 100% domestic. It was driven by domestic issues and concerns, and much less geopolitical. It wasn't an embrace of, of the West or NATO over Russia. The second lesson learned and the third lesson learned were related. It was looking at what happened in Ukraine and Georgia to avoid mistakes. In Georgia first, the idea was after the war with Russia, the loss of two breakaway territories or regions, which are now occupied by the Russian military, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. There was a move by Georgia that we would say in the United States, they drank the Kool-Aid. They actually believe NATO membership will, will solve all their problems. The lesson for the Armenian government and for Armenia has been a little more realistic and a little more cautious that the EU is very important, but it's not the answer to all of our problems. And NATO membership is not in Armenia's interest at this time. I think these are more prudent. And Armenia's relationship with Russia, no matter what we think of Putin, is important and realistically always will be. We have to be very careful 
with balancing pro-Western orientation with a stable relationship with Russia, unlike Georgia, which tends to go a little extreme in one direction. The other lesson learned was Ukraine, where in many ways the revolution of Maidan, of dignity, was hijacked by a new generation of rather questionable, if not corrupt, political leaders in Kiev. The danger in Armenia was to avoid the Velvet Revolution being taken over or hijacked by other new political or corrupt elites. So I think that's very important. And I think the real challenge for any Armenian government is regaining balance. How to deal with Russia and keep the West. But to find a room to maneuver in terms of even navigating our position within the Russian orbit, if you will, the gravitational pull, and trying to strengthen independence and sovereignty. And two good examples of perhaps how we gave away too much in mortgaging independence is the fact that Armenia's two borders externally with Iran and Turkey are controlled by Russian border guards, not Armenian. That's a little bit of a sign of a dangerous and risky mortgaging of national security. Another example is the Russian military base in Armenia, which unlike other Russian or even American military bases, Russia doesn't pay for the cost of that base. The Armenian government does, even down to the electricity and the water, the operational expenses, which is a bit of an insult to Armenian security and independence. If you have anything to add, feel free. From a Hawaiian perspective, anything to add? Not for now. Mahalo, okay. There is, interestingly, a very small but very influential Armenian community in Honolulu. Ruben Alzizian is an old friend of mine, uh, working for the U.S. Navy in Honolulu. Um, in fact, I've been there twice. It's yeah. quite nice. Um, but are you from Michigan originally? In terms of Michigan, and even more than California, or in terms of Massachusetts, is there more interest in your local community in events in Armenia? And especially not only since April and May, where the change of government, but even from Anthony Bourdain's visit to Armenia and CNN food show, is there more interest on a local level? In terms of Armenians or non-Armenians? Well, probably both. Uh, I am not very involved in the Armenian community in Detroit, mostly because I don't live near it. Um, and. I am involved in the Armenian Studies program at U of M, and so I know that most of the Armenians my age I know want to come here at least to visit or have been, but want to stay for a longer period of time and actually like kind of do what we're doing. Um, but uh, I also didn't really see any of them post-revolution because school ended, so I'm not sure where everyone stands. Do you expect to see more interest? Uh, I mean, I would, but also I think people in general, if you have people specifically, can surprise you. In a negative sense, too. Yeah, yeah. In, in both senses. Right. I could see, you know, way more interest in a nicely surprising way or decreased for whatever reason. What about Massachusetts? Um, I think it's or hard New to York, know. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. It's hard to gauge, like, either one, but I think, like, there is definitely more, like Armenia has been in the news and like people who might not I'm know not anything bad. about it, yeah, they're yeah. looking at it. Yeah, like ever since the war broke out in 2016, like people are kind of looking into like, what is this conflict? Like, what is this region of the world that they may have never heard of? So I think it's- <laughs> We're still asking yeah. that question. <laughs> okay. So it's like, I think it's increasing. Um, I wouldn't expect it to kind of skyrocket immediately, but yeah. Okay, now from a California, perspective, the reason I kept you separate, whether San Jose or Glendale originally, 
I, I assume, given the numbers of the community, that there's a little more awareness of Armenia and the Armenians. Yeah, definitely. Like the zombie chicken, you know, this yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making a moment. <laughs> But yeah, no, definitely there, there is always a, the Armenian community is always constantly talking about Armenia, whether it's just in a, in a casual sense, or there's always talk about, you know, things that are going on, and especially after the 2016 war, uh, in Nagorno Karabakh, has been a, uh, what's the word for, sort of like a re, like vamping of like energy. Or fear. And, yeah. <laughs> Concern. Yeah. Concerns. Uh, in fact, in fact, let's focus now on the significance of that April 2016 renewed hostilities or four-day war. But uh, anyone ready for more war? All right. Oh, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm using an excuse to be right back. Yeah. Guys, don't be shy. Ask him. He's so interesting, I think. But do ask him anything that you think of that. Okay, looking at April 2016, uh, it may be as much, if not even more significant than the change of government. What happened in April 2016? And I feel okay with challenging this question and posing it to you, because you guys brought it up. What happened in April 2016? Uh, Armenia attacked Azerbaijan again, right? No. What happened? Then? The rhetoric is, or, um, what's I understand, my understanding of it that many people, even the Americans that I've spoken to, who are aware of this uh, event, is uh, that Azerbaijan launched an attack um, to in the run of the take over to retake the land. Um, and it was a very revamped war effort attack compared to just the Manila border shootings that occurred normally. Um, they came with helicopters and lots of troops and um, basically stopped them. And there was obviously like, there was a lot of fighting, obviously. It was a war, but um, so Armenia was able to defend itself. Like when the Ar Armenia was able to. There's that, yeah, there's that connection with Nagorno Karabakh was able to defend itself, but there was obviously there was Armenian forces. There are Armenian forces that, that are there. Uh, on you get an A for honesty. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, the reason I ask is also, um, in general, of course you're correct, but there are some specific nuances. Uh, first of all, why it's significant. Clearly, it was the most serious fighting since the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that the Azerbaijani military performed very well. In other words, we would be hurting ourselves if we deny the degree of success by the Azerbaijani side. And militarily, the reason for their success was based on, for the first time, they were able to conduct a limited campaign based on clear objectives. Because up until then, the Azerbaijani armed forces would usually attack just to attack. The junkyard dog likes to bark or try to bite. This time, there was a clear, concise plan. But what's interesting militarily, it wasn't about Nagorno-Karabakh. The real objective of the attack was to retake or to seize and secure territory outside of the borders of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's what's called the occupied territories, areas of Azerbaijan beyond the borders of Nagorno-Karabakh. And this is what they were successful in. Now, what's interesting too is for Azerbaijan, it may be now too tempting not to try again, to deliver a military victory, which was also a very effective distraction from domestic problems. Now, the Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh response militarily was 
good, as you said, was able to halt the fighting. But was, what's interesting is the details. For example, what's most significant is not just what happened, but what didn't happen. In other words, Armenia, even more than the Gorokhara law, decided not to respond 100% did not use its full military arsenal, tried to contain this campaign. What was also interesting is how the fighting stopped. How did the fighting stop? Did the Azerbaijanis or the Armenian Karabakh sides just one day say, ah, we're done, folk nemek? What happened? I understand that. Okay. It was an agreement on the fifth day that was reached in Moscow. And we all know about the ceasefire agreement that was in effect since 1994. What was achieved in Moscow, however, was an agreement to cease firing, not a ceasefire agreement. There's a difference. And what was interesting was it was the defense minister of Azerbaijan and the chief of staff of the Armenian Armed Forces with the Russians that reached the agreement, no one from the Karabakh. Interestingly as well, not the Armenian defense minister. But it also shows that of the three countries mediating the conflict, Russia in many ways has the most leverage over events on the ground militarily. Why? Why does Russia have such leverage? They have like, they sell weapons to both sides. They have a yeah. significant stake in the military of both countries. We didn't compare notes, but I agree with Justin. What I would argue is, over the past several years, Russia has emerged as the number one arms provider to Azerbaijan, not just Armenia. It has even replaced Turkey as the military patron. This is the real leverage. Who are the other two mediators over the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? It's the Armenian Assembly and Armenian National Committee. That's a joke. What other two countries are the mediators? You, you hear OSCE Minsk Group countries? So that's what he's asking about. Hungary and Iceland, right? France and the United States. These are the three countries, Russia, France, and the United States, that are the direct mediators of, of the conflict. Any observation on why these three countries, or anything significant about France, the US, Russia, regarding the Gorno Karabakh? Which of the three has a military presence in the Gorno Karabakh? Russia. No. No. None. There is no Russian military presence in the Karabakh. The other question is, which of these three countries has a large Armenian diasporan population? Algeria. Yes. That's one of Azerbaijan's biggest complaints. And why these three countries? Why France, the United States, and Russia? Guesses. I mean, the United States and Russia are two big superpowers. France is more an accident of history in terms of their role is more to sit between the U.S. and the Russians in the mediating efforts. And France doesn't represent the European Union at all in this process, which is also interesting. Uh, is there a diplomacy? Is there a peace process over Nagorno-Karabakh? What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, is there diplomatic meetings between parties to the conflict trying to reach a negotiated peaceful resolution? Think of what Masis Malian was hopefully talking about. Justin? I know there are diplomatic uh, proceedings, but they're not very fruitful. 
Good, but there are diplomatic proceedings. Who participates? Not in the Karabakh. Really? Why not? You would think all parties to the conflict would be in a peace process, no? Well, they're not like officially recognized. Okay. So who represents the Muhammad Karabakh? Azerbaijan? Armenia, let's see. Armenia. So it's Armenia, Azerbaijan with the three mediators. I'm asking. <laughs> think of Jeopardy, yeah. <laughs> We can hit the buzzer now, yeah. Yeah, there's the OSC right. next year, but that's like the organization that the US and France uh, work through. And Russia. They're the three co-chairing nations of the NIMS group. But as you said, the diplomatic process isn't really going anywhere. And after April 2016, it's also because for Azerbaijan, it's too tempting not to try to use force. What's interesting, though, is despite the fighting, who is militarily strongest in the region? Armenia. Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. They have separate uh, armed forces in structure, but are generally much more uh, combat ready and militarily stronger than Azerbaijan or even Georgia. In other words, the idea is that strength is a deterrence, preventing attack. The other advantage for the Armenian Karabakh side is we don't have any offensive appetite. We don't have any desire to take more territory from Azerbaijan. Armenia is the only country in this region that is not a threat to its neighbors, whether it's Turkey. Georgia or Azerbaijan and Iran, Armenia does not pose an offensive threat. What's interesting is Armenia is also much more stable among the countries in the region, even with the change of government, much more stable and reliable or predictable compared to what's going on within Turkey, within Azerbaijan, or even within Iran. And that is an advantage especially for a country of such small size and small economy. What's the outlook for Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh? Where do you see Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh going over the next 10 to 20 years? Well, he speaks. Yeah, in my opinion, I think that Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh in the next 10, 20 years are gonna be a lot stronger and they're going to finally unite as one Armenia, big Armenia. That's my opinion. Hopefully, I don't, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I just hope it happens. Okay, when you say big Armenia, um, that raises other questions. Do you mean that the size will increase or that they will unify? They will unify. Good, that's important to note because um, it would be risky or dangerous to aspire to more aggressive, you know, expansion of greater yeah. army. Okay, good. Um, but what that means is independence for Nagorno-Karabakh, therefore, would be less of an option. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Nagorno-Karabakh would have no more independence. No, no, no. My question is, if you're advocating unification with Armenia, therefore. The question or issue of independence for Nagorno-Karabakh would therefore be less. Be less independent? I'm asking you. In other words, there should be a trade-off, no? If Nagorno-Karabakh is independent, it wouldn't be able to unify with Armenia. If it unifies with Armenia, it wouldn't be independent. So it's a trade-off? Oh, I see where you're going now. Oh, so just, I not think this word. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer, is your opinion? Oh, 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 like you're saying, if, if Nagorno-Karabakh never is, is still independent, and, and then like Armenia wants to unify, I'm thinking. Did you guys understand my question? Yeah, I'm trying to understand. Okay. In other words, okay, let me explain my opinion and see if you agree. 
Okay. Navona Karabakh is, and you visited, I would say to be fair, it's what's called in English schizophrenic. Sometimes it's committed to independence for Navona Karabakh, Kosovo style, independence which is quite different than unifying with Armenia. The other half of the schizophrenia is the unification with Armenia. My personal opinion is close to your original opinion. I think Karabakh is too small demographically in terms of population, economy, to become independent. Kosovo was very much not the example, but the exception. And I don't think the international community would easily accept Nagorno-Karabakh with such a small size and population as an independent country. Therefore, I think unification with Armenia is perhaps more prudent and realistic. One thing is clear, there is no chance of Nagorno-Karabakh going back to Azerbaijan control. This is why I was asking you cannot have both independence and unification with Armenia. So that's what I was getting at. Oh, I see what you mean. But some people in Nagorno-Karabakh are committed to independence and do not want to be unified with Armenia. Is it the current, like, is it the current uh, president who's more uh, interested in independence? Well, you guys met with the president, the foreign minister, and the parliamentary chair. What did they say? <laughs> Not much, it seems. <laughs> okay. Maybe the schizophrenia really hit home that day. Did they say anything about this? I think they were very focused on kind of self-sufficiency yeah. development. Mm -hmm. Well, self-sufficiency implies building a path toward independence. Right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, in your meetings there, it was about self-sufficiency in terms of economic development, why you should invest in the Bona There's a little bit of dialogue about that. I'm not surprised, but okay. <laughs> Anything else, or it was all secret? <laughs> I wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting, yeah. she boycotted the meeting. <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> Especially the president. Um, well, he's not my friend, don't forget him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's for a reason. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he was very surface level. Um, it, I think she really was here. She, she, she understood a little bit better because they were speaking in Armenian all the time. It was hard to who? Me. But who? Uh, this is another. Member. Another intern who was out of the city today. Okay, so thank you for not boycotting today. <laughs> like Lily. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, what do you guys think? Should it be independent? Should it not be independent? Okay, the boss is challenging you now. So yeah. You're on the spot. Um, I, I agree with what you were saying, what you were saying about the... Uh, you're a diplomat. <laughs> about just international, the international community recognizing such a small state and for it to develop so self-sufficiently, um, I think it would be a possibility, but it would be very difficult. And it has a, there is a reliance on Armenia in a certain extent. I mean, the, the economy is completely reliant between, with Armenia. Uh, I think it's interesting to know what would happen if it united with Armenia, because as you were saying, there's no current Russian uh, military base or presence in uh, Republic of Arkansas. Thank God. Yeah. My footnote here. Yeah. And I, 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 I think the outcome would be very interesting. Uh, but I do see it coming out ultimately as my, my tendency is to believe that it will be unified at some point. Um, yeah. That's what I, I, I think will be happening. What was the question again? You, you answered it, don't worry. Do you, you guys want to add anything? See, you started this too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well done. Good job. Yeah,
I mean, I think it's most logical to believe that they'll eventually unify uh, for the reasons already stated. Um, it's very small. It's already been denied international recognition. It's continually being denied international recognition. Uh, there's, in terms of politics, really no force that's you know guiding the international community to say, oh, Nagorno-Karabakh is its own thing. Um, so, I mean, for those reasons, I see them unifying. Also, I think it would be good for Armenia as well with two strong militaries that aren't, you know, technically unified, combining would be in their favor. Good. Well, I want to add something. Sure. I remember when I asked one of the officials that that white thing was on the Karabakh flag. The white thing. <laughs> <laughs> They told me that it means that once Armenia and Karabakh unite, that white thing will be disappearing because the white thing says that they are not yet united, but they will be united one day. That's what got me to the idea that these two will unite one day and become a bigger Armenia. Not only is that an interesting answer, but between us, whoever said that completely made that up. Oh, yeah. but I give him, and I think I know who it is. I give him credit for imagination. But yeah, sure. I think that well, was the president's like deputy. Yeah. Oh, you know him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't forget, I saw all the photos from your meetings. That's how I know who you met with too. But what's interesting was, having said all that, Nagorno-Karabakh has a much more impressive record of free and fair elections than either Azerbaijan or Armenia, to its credit. What's interesting is it also reveals that it's not that hard to have a democracy when you have a population of about 100,000 people. But in terms of reform, there is progress, and there has been more consistent progress. What else do you want to talk about? Justin, I'm going to put you on the spot. You were really interested in meeting Richard and well, talking with him. Yeah. I know, seriously. <laughs> um, what were some of the topics that you wanted to discuss with Richard? Um, well, I mean, it's very like broad. I don't have a very specific question, but what I guess what, specific answer, yeah. so worry. <laughs> like, what, what is your opinion on like Turkish genocide denial? If there's ever going to be recognition, what the process of <laughs> recognition would look like for the Turkish government? Good. This is an opportunity, perhaps, to find an issue where we may disagree instead of agree. Actually, my opinion has changed since moving here and living here. For example, my grandfather is a survivor, was a survivor of the genocide. Genocide recognition has long been one of the fundamental pillars. Yet, over the past several years, I support the process of so-called normalization, opening the border and establishing diplomatic relations with Turkey first, without necessarily demanding progress over genocide recognition. Part of the reason my opinion has changed was for the past several years, much of our time on April 24th, myself and our staff, we commemorate the Armenian Genocide in Istanbul with Turks as well as Armenians, with Turks who are questioning the official version of events and denial of the genocide. What's also interesting is despite the attention on the US Congress or the French Parliament, the real arena that matters is moving toward genocide recognition within Turkey in Turkish public opinion, and the Turkish state is actually at least two or three steps behind its own public opinion. And to be honest, this isn't about revenge, it's about recognition, where Turkey and the Turkish government's policy of denial not only creates more problems for itself, but actually makes this more of a problem than it would be especially given the fact that for many ordinary Turks, events of 1915 
have little to do with them in their current life. Many of them have less of a problem admitting what happened. And in that context, Turkey's actually trying to rewrite its own history. And the negative repercussions there are significant. On the other hand, one criticism as we push for normalization is for too long, I would argue, we've been overly obsessed with one issue. Not democracy in Armenia, not Nagorno-Karabakh enough, not the economic development of Armenia, but with one litmus test. The Armenian Genocide, yes or no. This is not helpful in terms of building bridges. It's also destructive to the development of the modern Republic of Armenia. And to be honest, the previous default position of the diaspora has been a little bit too obsessed with this one issue and not enough with the bigger issues or equally important issues, if you will. In other words, one hope we have in Armenia is that the future of this country and the Gorno Karabakh become more the center of gravity for the diaspora and much less genocide recognition. Also because one interesting thing is as the diaspora develops, because it's very much a living organic entity, what happens when Turkey recognizes the genocide? What happens the next day to Haytan? What happens the next day to the identity of the Armenian diaspora? And one criticism, whether it's Glendale or Boston, or Buenos Aires or Paris, in general, Armenians of the diaspora come together in unity one day a year. And it's usually based on hating the Turk and protesting the genocide. 364 days of the year, other than April 24th, we either compete politically in our organizations, or the Barska Highs don't like the Amerika Highs, who don't like the Beiruta Highs, who don't like the Hayastasis. In other words, this is not only the ghetto mentality, but also shows that the traditional political parties of the diaspora, very important historically, they've been around since 1890, and they show it, because the mindset is still 19th century. We need to go beyond that. And this is why most communities, especially in North America, have at least two Armenian churches, sometimes across the street from each other. This too is a further destructive element. But the real way out of this dilemma and how to present more of a united front against Turkish policy of denialism is actually to invest, not just financially, but emotionally, in the future of the one country we have. It's not the Agump in Glendale. It's the Republic of Armenia. And I think that's what needs to change a bit. Having said that, I'm a little bit overly critical in the other direction. Having been raised in the diaspora, my perspective has changed since living in the daily reality of today's Armenia. In terms of normalization with Turkey, do you think that that's a possibility while there's still Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan's border? I think yes, and the reason why is if we look at the first round of normalization, Armenia and Turkey signed two diplomatic protocols to normalize relations. The reason it didn't work was Turkey made a strategic mistake by underestimating Azerbaijan's reaction. What's interesting about the protocols that were signed is not just what they say, but what they don't say. There's no reference at all to the Armenian Genocide. But there's no reference to Nagorno-Karabakh or Azerbaijan either. This was a success for Armenia in delinking the issues. What Turkey's trying to do now is reconnect Nagorno-Karabakh and progress over that conflict with Armenia-Turkey normalization. 
but it's disingenuous. And what Turkish officials privately admit is their frustration with the fact that little Azerbaijan, the little brother of the relationship, has such unfair power over Turkish options in the region, and they resent that. The other reason is, whether it's economically, whether it's dealing with the Kurds in Western Armenia, Eastern Turkey, there are added benefits and incentives for Turkey to normalize relations with Armenia. The real reason we haven't seen success is not because of Azerbaijan. It's because we're hostage to domestic politics in Turkey and the crazy tendencies of Sultan Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, uh, and much less because of the Karabakh. So I am a bit optimistic. The other reason is for Armenia-Turkey normalization, it was never supposed to be that easy or that quick. Over the medium to long term, it is worth investing in. Secondly, the borders haven't opened, but the mental borders have. And we have direct flights between both countries that have never stopped. We have bilateral trade, and it's much less the taboo in each society as it once was. What's interesting is the change of government in Armenia. You'll notice two fundamental elements of Armenian foreign policy remain unchanged. First, a policy of no preconditions regarding Turkey, normalization, remains the policy from the previous government. Second, Nagorno-Karabakh and the peace process. Even though the current government is a little weaker in its credentials and a little more cautious. This is also, let's say, confirmation that much of the change of government was not geopolitics. It wasn't foreign policy. Although it did result in the foreign minister being replaced, which is a separate discussion, probably off camera. <laughs> OK, um, any other questions? Richard, this is always fascinating to, to meet with you and talk with you, and I hope you guys, if you have any further questions, take them up on the opportunity, because I don't know when you'll get a chance to talk with Richard again. Um, but on behalf of the interns and the assembly, I thank you. Um, thank you. And, thank you. Okay. <laughs> when do you guys leave? I leave on the 11th, 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, the program started in June and it ends on August 10th. Um, a few of the people are staying a few days longer, but um, for the most part, uh, they'll be gone within the following week. But overall, I think it was a very positive experience for you. I mean, every year we get to see a different group within the Armenian Assembly Summer Program, and each time we come away impressed, both with the quality as well as the substance. But it's also luck. You guys are here at a turning point in Armenian history in many ways. Uh, so much so that the significance of this time won't be measured for years to come. Mm -hmm. Especially as we move to new elections, even embarking on new policies that are somewhat at least revolutionary, if not a revolution. Mm -hmm. So question. come back next year is what he's saying. Exactly. <laughs> One other question though. Any other interesting meetings beyond the Bona Karabakh that you guys had or lectures? <laughs> Who were some, what, what, what were some of your favorites? Yesterday we met with uh, Elena Semerchian. Semerchian. Um, Have you met her yet? Who is she? Agent Sorry, Agent. go ahead. Go she ahead and finish. She no. is like everything, she works for NASA and like the Glendale City Council and like just a bunch of different. And visiting the other one. She's visiting. She's here for about another month or so, and she's also a UNICEF. Um, I want to say ambassador, but that's not quite the right word. She uh, something like that, but for her area, and uh, she'll be at the event next okay. week. So you, I'll introduce you to her, and if you, for some reason, can't make it. Just let me know and I can put you in touch with her. I think it'd be interesting for you to meet with her. And she is really, she's just 
Because she she's that. got so much experience she in went, so many areas. She talked for like 20 minutes just about the past like 10, 15 years of her life and she's done everything. Which is like cool. Yeah, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my favorite talks. And that video will also be up so you can watch that. I just haven't had a chance yet. Who else have you guys met with? Oh, no, Tevon Pagosi. Oh, boy. It's interesting. I'm not sad. He was actually the first representative of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, in Washington, D.C. And that's where I first met him. Yeah. He was my neighbor in Chevy Chase. Ah, okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm. Yeah. We've met a lot of interesting people. <laughs> oh, we missed the... And, uh, from our oh, good. I like that. Um, you know Anthony Barsanian, right? Yeah. Anthony's son, Rafi, was one of our interns this summer. Uh, but he, was, he, he arrived earlier and left earlier. Um, and he was interning with Sergei and Nade. Oh, cool. And so when, now that they've switched over to Arm Comedy Live, one day we went over to watch one of their, their, uh, their filmings. Exactly. Their, Taping. Like John Stewart almost mm -hmm. uh, Martin yeah. Good. Yeah. And don't forget we had Conan O'Brien in Armenia last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then later Sergei and Narek were on Conan O'Brien exactly. back in yeah. LA. Okay, so I'm gonna say I'm gonna turn this off and say thank you once again. Thank you. Always thank appreciate you. it. Good to see you again now uh, that the uh, summer season will well and our, our thirty days later soon be our ending. And our briefings will resume so you Excellent. start coming back. In September? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Look for uh, Richard holds monthly briefings. Uh, for the diplomatic community. Yes, and, and it's, it's confidential, so I really should stop talking. Oh, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> there are briefings yeah. every month providing an analytical assessments. Yeah, and, and fascinating and in, uh, interesting information. So I look forward to that. I'm glad that you're back in town. I look forward to seeing you again. and. I think on behalf of the interns and everyone here, I can thank say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What's that? Trust me, I'll come and see you.